So across the mass spectrum from left to right is the focal plane. Typically one would arrange a series of electronic detectors here or 40 years ago you'd have a photographic plate. What is truly evolutionary about Gary's design is the use of a focal plane camera. The focal plane camera was the result of uh, a development program between Bonner Denton in um, Arizona, uh, Dave Copenell of Pacific Northwest Laboratory in Washington, and Gary in Indiana. This focal plane camera is a solid state device. It went through four generations of development over about six years. And what it is is a series of Faraday detectors in the form of a fine strip of metal. And in this case it was aluminum, other cases it was gold. The pixel width of the Faraday detector is only 8.5 micrometers and they're separated by four micrometers. So this thing is capable of multi-isotope detection when it is placed in the focal plane here. Of course it's very short and it can't uh, grab the entire mass spectrum. So that's a problem. That problem was solved by some work with, um, with Bonner Denton and the Spectro Instrument Company, unbeknownst to Gary Hefia, and to his surprise, a commercial instru instrument was introduced by Spectro at the Winter Conference in 2010. This instrument is based on a focal plane camera that has 4,800 Faraday detector channels. So it's relatively big, it's 12 centimeters in, in length, and therefore it can cover the full mass spectrum of the matog herzog geometry. It provides a sensitivity approximately equal to a TOF, but improved relative standard deviation on isotope ratio precision. So what are the advantages of uh, simultaneous detection like you achieve with that matog herzog instrument or a time of flight? Reduce sample consumption because you measure all the elements almost all the time. Increase sample throughput. Elimination of something called spectral skew. If you are looking at a time evolving signal, let's say you're looking at, um, I don't know, arsenic coming out in a HPLC chromatogram. It will grow in time and then decrease in time as a, as a chromatographic peak. If you're looking at two different isotopes of that same element, obviously not arsenic, um, and you're trying to match them one to the other, if you have a sequential system, by the time the intensity is recorded at one moment in time for the first isotope, some period of time has passed before the second isotope can be recorded and the intensity has changed either up or down depending on where you are on the peak. That introduces something called spectral skew and it skews the isotope ratios. If you have a truly simultaneous measurement technique, that problem vanishes. You have enhanced measurement precision, unlimited use of internal standards, and elimination of correlated noise. Correlated noise is primarily flicker noise and it comes from uh, flicker in the, in the ICP, flicker in the intensity of the ions that, be, that are detected. And this noise source affects all isotopes, all M over Z ratios. So if a true signal is given by SM, it is convoluted with some time dependent noise. If you're looking at the ratio of two signals of, from two isotopes, they will each be convoluted with this time dependent noise. The, if you are measuring them sequ sequentially, this will be convoluted with noise at time one, this is noise at time two. You will get a distorted ratio. If you are measuring them simultaneously, obviously the noise at time one will be equal to the noise at time one or time two and you'll get the true ratio. And we can see that with signal correlation amongst the different ICP platforms. With the quadrupole, a correlation coefficient is very small when we correlate one isotope against another and we have the isotope ratio. It looks like a scatter graph and indeed isotope ratio precision is limited to about a tenth of a percent. If we move to a time of flight detection system where there's quasi simultaneity in the detection, we begin to see a pattern and the correlation coefficient is improved and the isotope ratio precision is improved. There's still some noise. If we go to a truly simultaneous instrument, such as a multi-collector ICP from new or thermal, 
we see almost a straight line here, very large correlation coefficient, and 10 parts per million on isotope ratio precision. The last new instrument that's been introduced into the ICPMS market has been done by Agilent, and it's called their 8800, introduced in 2012, and it's dubbed a triple quadrupole system. Triple quadrupole systems have been available in the organic sector field for many, many years. So whether you call it evolution or revolution, it was bound to occur. It's just somebody had to take the step to produce it. So there's basically three quadrupole type filters here. One of them in the center is really a reaction cell. And uh, it, it is used to, first of all, take in a sample through the uh, initial quadrupole filter, isolate the M over Z that you're intending to measure, uh, maybe react it with something or react an interference with something to separate that isotope you're interested in from a potential interference and then pass it through the second filter onto the detector. I'll illustrate that in a moment. What's interesting about this instrument is that it provides detection limits on the PPT range, typical of quadrupole based instruments. But if you look at the red lines here, you will see it provides phenomenal theoretical resolution. You can get rid of isobaric interferences or molecular isotopic and even elemental isotopic interferences with this technique. I mentioned earlier that a high resolution instrument operating in 3000 resolution could remove the interference of argon oxide on iron. That's only 3000 resolution. Look what is ultimately capable with this instrument, 229 million. I don't think you can do that with the Fourier transform instruments right now. I'm not sure, maybe, maybe you know. Here's an example of the removal of the interference of mercury 204 on lead 204. Very important for a lot of geochemical applications. The first filter is designed or tuned to pass M over Z204. It goes into this octopole reaction cell and some ammonia in helium is admitted here at a few milliliters per minute and there's a very selective charge transfer reaction which neutralizes mercury. The second filter is tuned to 2004 and obviously there's only, mercury, only lead that goes through the, to the detector. So we removed all the mercury very selectively and that provides for 229 million in resolution. Another example, uh, determination of titanium in a very complex mixture of blood. Here, mass 48 is being measured, or you would like to measure 48, that's the titanium isotope. But we have interferences from molecular species of argon carbide and sulfur oxide. We also even have an isobaric interference from calcium at 48. The first filter passes everything with M over Z48. So that means uh, in this cell, we have titanium and we also have, uh, what's the other, calcium, I guess, eh? So in this cell, we can't, we, we then introduce ammonia and helium again, and we allow a very selective and very fast reaction chemistry, ion molecule chemistry to occur. The titanium selectively reacts with the ammonia, forming a six ammonia adduct of nominal mass 150. That means the calcium, whose mass is still 48, will not pass the third quadrupole tuned to mass 150. And that gives you a selective determination of titanium again, but in a mass shift mode from 48 to 150, and you have this very high resolution. Now, this, this um, analysis could be conducted with a conventional sector field instrument using a resolution of 3000. But if you did that, by brute force, you have to close the slit, the mechanical slit on this instrument, and that reduces the intensity of the signals and raises the detection limit to 100 nanograms per liter. Here we sacrifice nothing, detection of three nanograms per liter. Um, in Spain, Alfredo Sanz Modell has utilized this instrument. Uh, also, before I forget, I want to say that Professor Nebrega has, has had his hands on this instrument. And he has utilized it in this same mode, and I believe it was for the measurement at least sulfur and phosphorus in biodiesels, was it? In, yeah. And, and he used this, this same kind of elimination of isobaric interference, demonstrating the high capability and superb performance of this kind of instrument. Very simple instrument, but very, very powerful. Sans Modell has been interested in proteomics and the use of inorganic mass spectrometry to characterize heteroatoms in proteins, sulfur and phosphorus. These are difficult to measure, 
in conventional ICPMS, but now maybe with the triple quadrupole, that will become easier. And in fact, that was easier in Alfredo's laboratory. He reported the lowest detection limits ever for sulfur and phosphorus, 11 and 6 femtomoles. And he concluded that ICPMS with this instrument was now poised for expansion of applications in the area where high matrices concentrations were introduced into the ICP, but low limits of detection were still required with control of interferences from these matrices. An example would be introducing laser ablated particles. The entire matrix goes in and you don't introduce really much analyte because a laser ablation event introduces only nanogram amounts of material at a time. There's been a long history of use of the inductively coupled plasma in the life sciences, 10 years now probably. And unfortunately, this is cut off at the top. But here you see the latest review in this area. And it is a comparison of the use of classical tandem mass spectrometry, MS, MS with ICPMS for metallomic characterization. And of interest here is metal proteins, metallo DNA addicts, metal labeled molecules and any other metal binding proteins and biomolecules. The use of ICPMS is great because it provides these sub-femtomole detection limits, high spatial resolution, good selectivity, and it complements tandem mass spectrometry. So in a typical example of protein identification in a sample, I borrow this slide from Joe Caruso, who was here, was it last year? Yes. A long time ago already. So he's kindly lent me this slide. I bugged him for it. Uh, as an example of the use of ICPMS in proteomics. And so you start off with some samples. Maybe you're already familiar with this. Anyways, you separate the, the various protein fractions using a classic example of 2G, 2D gel electrophoresis. You screen uh, looking for heteroatoms or other metal constituents by using laser ablation ICPMS. And once you locate uh, a band, you then literally cut it out and you subject it to enzymatic or triptych digestion and then further characterize these individual digests through uh, both MALDI-TOF MS and NanoHPLC electrospray MS. And the results that come out of here, you feed into a spectral library of proteins and you identify the metalloprotein. The other way of doing this with purely ICPMS is to do a triptych digest of the material to begin with, separate out the various fractions using size exclusion chromatography and re reverse phase liquid chromatography, send these effluents streams into ICPMS and electrospray MSMS machines simultaneously, get the same kind of information and do the peptide identification. Now, Gary Heafy takes a look at this and he says, I got a bright idea and I'm, I'm going to combine both of these techniques into one instrument. And for several years, he worked on uh, a dual source instrumentation. It was an electrospray and an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer based on time of flight geometry. So here he has um, an ICP and here he has an electrospray ion source. They both share a common gating or orthogonal acceleration uh, channel. So they shoot out the ions in this field free region going through the reflectron and back and they come back to separate detectors, multi-channel plates. The beams for the mass uh, spectrometry by electrospray and by ICP are actually stacked relative to each other in space by 10 centimeters. So he has independent measurements. They don't cross each other. And through a series of papers, again, unfortunately, we can't see this. This was all in 2010, all published in the journal Metalomics. He characterized this instrument, starting with the molecular channel, and then the atomic channel, and then the dual channel. And he said, well, he found out that his electrospray sensitivity was a little less sensitive than commercial electrospray instruments. The resolving power was adequate for metallomic studies because typically only small molecules were of interest. Atomic limits of detection were typical for ICPMS. Isotope ratio precision was good. But in this paper, he demonstrated online quantitative and qualitative determinations of species. And one that stands out in my mind were chromium species that he investigated in this paper. Unfortunately, no one, no instrument company has been interested in following up to produce a commercial version of this instrument. Uh, one other type of instrument that has hit the market in the last few years is something called a mass cytometer. A mass cytometer, again, is a contribution to the life sciences 
and the utilization of the power of the ICP to provide information for life sciences.